Well, what happened? After rematch, after FDA approval, DT should have taken off. But that's not what happened. Why not? Many of the things that I've alluded to already. The impediments to growth, they were bulky, noisy, lots of complications, limited durability. I guess that's my bulky. Boy, who, who's that, Mother, Mother Hubbard? No, who's, who's in the shoe? I'm sure my age. That's noisy. And that's one of our cardiac surgeons, by the way. <laughs> Probably me. We talked about durability. So the first generation device was therefore not very palatable to prospective patients nor their referring physicians. So we had proven therapy, but it didn't grow. And it didn't grow because the patients themselves, they saw this big thing and they met patients who they could hear from down the corridor, said, no, thank you. You know, and we understood that there were some that did the brave early uh, early guys, and they've all none of them to this day have said to me they regretted doing it. But it took a brave leap of faith. This is a big device. Importantly, the size of the initial device limited the patients who we could put it in. Many women were not candidates for getting the VAD because it was too big. You had to have a BSA above 1.7. That's changed with the new device. So overall, would we say that it was worth it? Well. Kind of me from the perspective of the surgeon, I got all excited. Just gonna play. So that's me, I'm all excited. Look, we put the VAD, but. <laughs> that's our nurse practitioners trying to keep us calm. We had a lot of enthusiasm. We were very excited, but we were frustrated because we had something good, but we couldn't translate it into having wide applicability. We wanted to get past the concept of prolonging someone's death and move it to a concept of prolonging life. That was the most important thing. The most important thing that we learned from all the first generation studies. We needed, we needed to have better pre-op selection. The better the patient was before the surgery, we knew the better they would do. Timing was very important. And right now, we have become extremely aggressive. You identify a patient, you get them in the best shape possible, and you go. All right, you don't delay, you don't dither, you go and you do it. Because you gotta get them before they start having, sometimes decisions have to be made, they gotta do paperwork at home, do their will, all of a sudden one excuse becomes another, and all of a sudden now they're in worsening renal failure or some other issue. So identify the appropriate candidate. And these guys, the, the, the patients that I've operated and the nurses that work, know that I, these patients have to beg me to do this procedure. I wanna see fire in their belly, you know? I wanna see that they want, they have a zest for life. You know, whether it's the grandchild that's graduating college or the daughter who's getting married, whatever it is, I want to see that zest for life because those are the ones who are going to do well. They're going to be the fighters. The perioperative period can be difficult. The first 48 to 72 hours are extraordinarily difficult. And we haven't been very good about being able to predict who's going to have a rough time and who's not. So we're prepared for everybody to have one. We need to have better devices, okay? You can't have something that's clanging away and making noise and big and causing infections, and we need to be, make sure that we take care of these patients as optimally as possible. So that brought us to the second generation devices, which is what we use today, the vast majority. This is the HeartMate 2. It's the only one approved for both bridge to transplant and destination therapy right now. Uh, and it's the only second generation device that's at, in market and probably will be in market. As I said, there's a third generation device that's approved for bridge to transplant, the HVAD but uh, we will be discussing that. So this device is much more miniaturized. The drive line is smaller. This is what exits. Patient wears this on belts or holsters. This is the controller and two batteries. This is what it looks like on x-ray. All these patients have AICD, bi-V pacers. Everybody's had their hand in them already. These guys have exhausted their option. And if the EP people find out we have them, forget all of a sudden the next day they're on the schedule. So. The Archimedes screw, uh, it's fascinating. So this is Archimedes, you know him, the Eureka I founded, the buoyancy of water and how you estimate weight. Well, one of the things he developed, there was a challenge in ancient Greece of getting water from the low-lying lands to the upper-lying lands for irrigation for the crops. So he developed this system, and I'm gonna give you a complicated definition, but it's really simple. So energy is used to rotate an axle in which a propeller system is used to propel uh, liquids against gravity. 
And what it looks like is something like this. So these are two intertwined tubes, sort of like a caduceus, that are wrapped around this axis. And there's someone at the top turning the thing. And it'll pull water up from the bottom to the upper container or the upper fields. And I do this to say, showing the small, but these were huge, long things going up hills. All right? It was a wonderful system, depended a lot on manpower, but it did the job. Uh, and I'll show you a little video of what this looks like. So it's, you can see this twirling column. Water is being brought as it twirls, gets pushed up the hill. The power is coming, obviously, from this semblance of a human being at top and bringing water up. It's fascinating because this is the tech, very technology 2,000 years ago that we use in the, in the second generation VADs. This is the inside of a second generation VAD. Okay, we have the pump. This is the inside of the pump. This is part of the pump housing. These are called statters. They only use, serve to direct blood flow. The patient, patient's LV apex is up here, and I'm gonna show you an operation. You'll see where, where these things go in. Blood flow comes in here. This inflow statter sets up the blood so it goes a straight stream into this spinning rotor. These things spin anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 rotations per minute. They're whizzing. Um, and they only touch at two points, at the bearings at each corner. You can see how this might be much more benign and much more have a much better wear and tear life. And the rotor just basically propels the blood forward. When it gets to the end here, it comes out in all sorts of a vortex, and the outflow stator just straightens out the blood flow so that it goes out the graft to the aorta. And this is just the dynamic of that. Blood flow is coming in here through the inlet stator. Here's a little pivot spinning. There's an electromagnet that causes the spinning and then goes out. Really simple, elegant. And this is more of what, what uh, we do surgically. So uh, here's a patient with bad heart. You put one cannula in the apex. We sew a cuff into the apex. I'll show you that. Blood flow goes in through here, through the pump. That mechanism I showed you is inside here. It's connected via the cable to our controller energy source. And then it goes up this graft. Notice there's no valves. So much simpler, fewer parts that can wear down over time. And the rest is just showing better blood flow to the rest of the body.